Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, my name's Eva Namasavayam, and I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Sheffield. And I'd like to share with you some research that I've been doing with my supervisor, Professor Bryn Stanley, entitled Vacuum Polarization in Three Dimensional Antidesitter Space Time with Robin Boundary Conditions. So, we work in the semi classical approach to quantum gravity, whereby the metric in Einstein's field equation is kept in its classical form. And we promote the stress energy tensor to the expectation value of its operator. And whilst we will be turning our attention to Team UNU in due course, for the moment we are being focusing on the expectation value of the square of a scalar field in a state A, which is called the vacuum polarization. When that state is a vacuum state, we refer to the vacuum expectation value of the vacuum polarization. And when that state is in a thermal state characterized by inverse temperature beta, we refer to the thermal expectation values. Our background, uh, space-time is three-dimensional antidesitter space, which is a maximally symmetric solution to Einstein's field equation with a constant negative curvature. Its metric is shown here, where L is the length scale and rho is our radial uh, coordinate, which runs from zero to pi over two, where pi over two is a space-time boundary. Now you will notice that the time coordinate is periodic, and this is a feature of ADS, and so we have these somewhat unphysical closed time-like curves, which is shown more clearly here in this two-dimensional uh, graphic of the space-time, and you have these uh, closed time-like curves. And to try and circumvent this, we consider that we work in the covering space of ADS, where the time coordinate is unwrapped and runs from minus infinity to infinity. Our focus today is a real scalar field of mass M, satisfying this Klein-Gordon equation, where our box here is the D'Alembertian operator in curved space, and Xi is the coupling constant which couples the scalar field to the Ricci scalar. The Ricci scalar is shown here, and the, uh, coupling, and the coupling constant for a conformally coupled field is one over eight in three dimensions. We also define a new term, nu, which is the square root of one plus mu squared L squared, where mu squared is given here. So essentially nu uh, encodes information about the mass and the coupling constant of our scalar field. And we consider nu between uh, the values of zero and one. Uh, so for instance, for a massless conformally coupled field, nu is one half. Now as um, antidesitter space is not a globally hyperbolic space time, we have to impose boundary solutions, boundary conditions on the radial solution at the space time boundary at rho equals pi over two. So the commonest boundary conditions are, of course, Dirichlet, where the value of the field vanishes at the boundary, and Neumann, where the derivative of the field vanishes at the boundary. But we also consider Robin boundary conditions, which is a linear combination of Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions, parameterized by the Robin parameter, which we have called zeta here, which runs between naught and pi. And you will see that when zeta is zero, we recover the Dirichlet boundary condition, and when zeta is pi over two, we recover the Neumann boundary condition. So to work out the expectation values, we have to first determine uh, the Feynman's Green's function, which is shown here, um, where this curly T represents the time ordered product of the field. The Feynman's Green's function satisfies this inhomogeneous PDE, where G is the metric of the uh, space time shown before, uh, and delta here is a three dimensional Dirac delta function. Now, as we bring the space time point together, our Green's function will be divergent, and so we employ Hadamard renormalization to get a meaningful result. And it can be shown that the divergent part of the Hadamard parametric is I over four pi S, where S is a proper distance between the space-time points. So with all this in hand, we are now in a position to calculate the renormalized expectation value of the square of the field by subtracting the divergent part of the Hadamard parametrics from the Feynman-Green's function, and then taking the limit as we bring the space-time points together. So this is just to show you what these green functions look like. So these are the vacuum greens functions with Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions, and they are of the form of hypergeometric functions, which depend on our parameter nu, and also the uh, proper distance between the space-time points. But interestingly, they do not depend on the space-time, on the radial coordinate rho, so they respect the background symmetry of the space-time. The difference between Neumann and Dirichlet is only in the sign of the first term. With the vacuum Green's function, we can actually calculate the thermal Green's function when these are shown here. 
And again, these are of the form of hypergeometric functions, uh, again involving nu, but this time they involve the radial coordinate rho, so they break the uh, underlying symmetry of the ADS space-time. And of course, they also are dependent on our inverse temperature beta. The difference between the Neumann and the dirichlet green functions are, again, just merely the sign of the first term. So with these green functions, we've been able to calculate the, expe the, the expectation values. So these are the renormalized vacuum expectation values of the square of the field with Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. And we can show that these are a constant. So they're independent of the space uh, of, the, of the radial coordinate and depend only on nu. And interestingly, that they only differ between the Dirichlet and Neumann uh, terms by the, the sign. To calculate the thermal expectation values, we consider the difference between the thermal expectation value and the vacuum expectation value as the divergences are common in both. So we don't, we, we, so we don't need to renormalize again. And then we just simply add on the respective uh, vacuum expectation value. So these have to be calculated numerically with Mathematica, which we have done. So these are our results for the thermal expectation values with both Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. So the expectation values are shown here on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, uh, we have our radial coordinate rho uh, and pi over two is a, is a space-time boundary. And on the other axis, we have our uh, parameter nu, which encodes information about the mass and the coupling constant. So you will see that as we approach the space-time boundary, the vacuum sorry, the thermal expectation values decrease progressively and in fact converge to the vacuum value at the space-time boundary. With Dirichlet, we see that the expectation values decrease with increasing rho. Uh, and with the Neumann value, uh, at the, the Neumann boundary condition, at nu equals zero, um, in fact, we actually get the same result as we do for the Dirichlet, although it's not so apparent here because of the difference in scale. But unlike the Dirichlet case, as we increase nu, uh, our thermal expectation values increase progressively and in fact begin to diverge at nu equals one. So at nu equals one, we only have Dirichlet boundary conditions and at nu equals zero, both Dirichlet and Neumann give the same result. So now we turn our attention to the vacuum polarization with Robin boundary conditions. And to do this, we have to work in Euclidean space by performing a wick rotation of the metric, which is now shown here. And our Green's function, our Euclidean Green's function play a very similar um, differential equation, this box operator here is now the box operator in Euclidean space. And I'll just show you the form of the vacuum and thermal um, Euclidean Green's functions uh, here. They're rather complicated, but we, we imply our Robin boundary conditions on the radial Green's function shown here as G. So these are our results. This is the vacuum expectation values with Robin boundary conditions for different values of the Robin parameter zeta. Now, when now these so when zeta is zero, we have the Dirichlet. When zeta is pi over two, we have the Neumann boundary. Uh, we have the Neumann uh, vacuum expectation value, and you will see that for all values of zeta studied, the expectation values converge to the Neumann result at the space-time boundary at pi over two, and we found this for all values of new. Study. This is an example where nu is three quarters. Uh, we also find a very similar result with the thermal expectation value with Robin boundary conditions. This time we've chosen nu of one quarter and beta of uh, four. And again, the Dirichlet and Neumann uh, boundary conditions are shown dotted. So we see that for all values of zeta studied, the thermal expectation values converge to the um, Neumann expectation value at the space-time boundary. And we found this for all, for all nu and for all beta. So in summary, uh, we have shown that the vacuum expectation values of the vacuum polarization with Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions are constant and respect the background symmetry of the ADS space-time. We have found that the thermal expectation values of the vacuum polarization approach the corresponding vacuum expectation values at the space-time boundary for all new. And we found that with the Robin boundary conditions, both the vacuum expectation values um, and thermal expectation values reach the Neumann value at the space-time boundary for all uh, Robin parameters considered and for all new, except for the Dirichlet uh, case, which has its own limit. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you very much. I will open the floor to questions. If there's any, uh, I'll give the audience a moment to type some in. Um, let me ask you a question from a slightly naive point of view. Is there a, a reason that you're interested in this Robin boundary condition in particular? Like it seems to be a mixture of the two. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, um, we want to just look at different values, different types of boundary conditions, because uh, I think probably the commonest ones that have been studied are the Dirichlet and Neumann. And I think, you know, we, we can apply the Robin boundary conditions when we consider new is between zero and one. So I think it's just useful to sort of see what values we get with that, really. Um, it's interesting that the Dirichlet seems to be a special case, that it doesn't fall into the same pattern as the others. That is interesting, actually, yeah. I mean, I think it, I suppose, essentially, that any bit of Neumann dominates the, the, the Robin boundary conditions. Really. Mm -hmm. And, and Dirichlet, I should say, is a special case. 